Did that opening song pump you up this morning? I won't be silent. Amen. Wow. It's so good to be in the presence of the Lord. And one person was prayed for today and is going to be baptized at the close of our service today. Hallelujah. And we already had another one on schedule, so we've got at least two baptisms. Are you ready to rejoice and celebrate new life? Woo! Buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. There's, I like new stuff. Do you like new stuff? I like new stuff. And uh, it's fun to get something new, isn't it? Yeah, and, and so it's exciting to get a new life. That's pretty awesome. Amen. Today, uh, we're going to share a few minutes on worship. And then uh, at the end, I'm going to call down our worship team and our uh, musicians, praise singers, and those who lead in the pulpit here to join me here at the front and give you an opportunity to a pray and anoint a fresh new anointing. On. We're training a new guy back there. Uh, it's okay. So uh, we're going to pray a fresh anointing on our worship team, and uh, I'm excited about that. I love what God is doing through the power of impartation, don't you? So the, the, the message today is on the subject of worship. And what a great setup we have for so much uh, worship that's happened already in this room today. And at the close of the message, uh, Paula and I, and along with Lindsay and Ben and Simeon and Selah, we're going to jet out of here, jump in our cars, and we're going to drive on a vacation, and we're going to get out of town, rest and relax. Amen? So... We, we would appreciate you keeping us in your prayers as we travel, and uh, we know that you're in good hands here with so many. Check one, two. I used to get upset when that happened. It don't bother me now. We got nothing else to do, right? Put batteries in the microphone. Mess with me, I'll vacuum the floor or something. No, I'm just kidding. If you're watching online, we're back. And nothing was wrong with your system at home. It was me. So, we're just going to take a few moments here and talk about worship. It's one of my favorite subjects. The Lord put something in me at an early age to dig in and study uh, the psalmist, David, who was a king, a prophet, and a priest to God. And he is such a good study when you want to know about praise and worship and how he developed his worship 
heart after God early in his life. And, and the Lord gifted him to play instruments. And uh, history says he handmade over 3,000 instruments. And he made hearts of wood and put strings on them and played music out in the field and his audience was the sheep and the Lord and from time to time a lion or a bear but most believers don't understand the power of worship we don't it's easy for us to to minimize worship we we often have Labeled the song service of the church meeting worship. And so we, we tend to, when we say worship, we tend to think there's, it's limited to the time in, in the church service on Sunday morning. And, and God wants to open us up. And God wants to expand you in your thinking of what worship really is. And I want to plant a seed in your heart today that you would go from this room and open up your Bible and begin to read the Psalms and read the book of uh, 2 Samuel and study David's life a little bit and get to know him as a king and as a priest and as a prophet and how he wrote and how he worshiped. And God said, he's a man after my own heart. I want to be a man after God's own heart. I I want to worship him with all of me. I don't want to just give him a a part of me. I want to give him all of me. Don't you? Amen. So the subject today is the supreme activity of the universe. Worship. Worship is the bowing down of the human soul and spirit to something or someone that we esteem to be higher than us. If we're not careful, we will esteem people and things higher than us, and God never intended for us to elevate others or things to the level of God himself in our eyes and in our life. There's only one God. The scriptures are written for our learning of just how high the Almighty is exalted. They remind us of our frailty and finite existence, invoking thoughts of gratitude and adoration for our Lord. As we read the scripture, that's the purpose that we should go for, is I want to find him to be higher, greater, and more mighty than I thought he was by reading about what he has said to me. And in reading the scripture, I also find that I must be humbled and bow down The posture of worship is a bowed position. Sometimes it's just laying flat out, spread eagle before the Lord. Amen? Sometimes it's kneeling or just kind of bowing over. But you realize he's high, he's mighty, he's so great. All I can do is come and bow down before him. I must humble myself in his presence. So today I'd like to answer for us the who, the how, and the where of worship, if I could. So turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 17. We'll find worship mentioned in the New Testament church setting. We'll find Probably the greatest apostle that ever lived, the Apostle Paul, speaking to a group of idolater 
idolaters or people who worshipped many gods. You don't have to look too far today in our culture to find people who worship many gods. Oftentimes, you don't even have to go outside of the church to find people whose devotion is split and scattered and divided because the world is ever pulling on you to put your devotion and your attention somewhere other than your maker. So in verse 22, Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. That's a word rooted in fear. If you understand the meaning of that word, it's rooted in fear. And, and he says, you're, you're basically afraid of too many things. There's too many things you're trying to appease. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Paul found in this, in the middle of this worship service to all these gods, Paul found an inroad. He found a way to preach Jesus to these people who were worshiping who knows what. Idols and statues and planets and the earth and the sun and whatever, right? Right? People worship all kinds of weird and funny things. And he said, you're just too superstitious. I mean, I can, I can help you with your devotion. Let me tell you about this one idol you've got over here that says, to the unknown God. See, they were so superstitious, they didn't want to leave anything out. So they thought, well, if we'll put one over here to the unknown God, then we got our bases all covered. Amen? And uh, that's how some people live their life. They're just trying to be safe, trying to live safe, safety first. That's not a, not a good principle. He says, you ignorantly worship him, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to declare him unto you, and you will no longer be ignorant about this. Verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth life to all, and breath, and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device, and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given us assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. 
When you hear this message and you look around at your silly little gods, no gods, man-made gods, it pretty much puts it all in perspective, doesn't it? I mean, look at your statue of whatever. I don't think that made all things. Amen? You, you can't show me a, another God that was raised from the dead. Amen? So it, it ought to be pretty simple. It ought to be pretty cut and dry. It ought to be really easy for you to pass from your ignorant worship to knowing the living God. I'm glad I know him, aren't you? Look at somebody and say, I'm glad I know. I'm glad I know. We used to sing a song, I'm glad I know who Jesus is. He's the maker of all things. He was crucified for my sin, buried and rose again from the grave. He came back alive whoa, to give me life and hope of a resurrection. I'm not just believing in some fairy tale or some pipe dream or some silly story. I'm not just chasing after something that was made. I'm chasing after the one who made it all. I'm pursuing him. I have a heart after him. I'm not just worshiping an imaginary person. How many of you ever had an imaginary friend when you were little? Oh, I did. I don't. You guys don't want to vote or you're ashamed of it? You didn't have an imaginary friend? Well, you were lonely. I had imaginary horses and comrades and fights. Come on, guys. We got to get them. You've got to have an imagination. But God is not a part of our imagination. He's not an imaginary God. He's real. He's living. He's powerful. He's in me. And in Him I live. In Him I move. In Him I have my being. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Woo. Some folks think serving the Lord is about doing, but it's really about being. In him we live and move and have our being. Be. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to be. He's not just checking off all you do. It's easy to get caught up in that. And there's no peace in that doing stuff. There's no peace in that checking off lists and rules and regulations and, and keeping score. Don't keep score. Look at your neighbor and say, quit keeping score. There's nowhere in the Bible that there's a scorekeeping system. Not, no New Testament believer should be keeping score of who's serving and who's not and how many times you got thanked for what you do for the Lord. Your reward is in heaven. Amen? We just need to get that and just live in peace and love everybody and do and give and serve and love and be... All that he made us to be. Amen. We are human beings, not human doings. Just take a deep breath. That's pretty cool. Whew. Pressure's off. If I don't get it done, I just don't get it done. Amen. So, Paul watches these people. Now, there's a lot to be said for these idolaters because they weren't monkeying around. They weren't ignoring their God. They were worshiping their God. See, the problem with some Christians is they think they can just ignore their God and everything's going to be fine. But the idolaters Paul watched at Athens, he said, I've observed your devotion. Is your life in Christ, is your worship and your devotion observable Paul could look and tell by their actions by their worship by their devotion that these people were too superstitious some guy said I'm not superstitious I'm just stitious <laughs> underachiever 
<laughs> You'd be surprised at how many Christians are superstitious. Oh, you're not supposed to do that. You know, the clock needs to be pointing up or you don't walk under ladders or whatever. The only problem with walking under ladders is if it falls. <laughs> There's no spiritual implication to walking under a ladder. There's more danger walking on one than there is walking under one. <laughs> Unless somebody's on the one you're walking under. Don't be superstitious. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Hey, Amen. You don't need to be throwing salt over your shoulder and doing rituals and rain dances and holidays and all that stuff. Be in Christ. Put all that stuff away. There's a lot of unknown God worshipers. And God wants to inform and enlighten the unknown God worshipers that he is Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the, in the next segment here. But if you're going to worship, why not worship the maker of heaven and earth? Why, why do we worship things that are made when we could be worshiping the maker of it all? I don't get it. People worship athletes, and they're going to get too old to perform. You know, those kids I grew up with worship Larry Bird. He's old. I mean... You're getting old, bud. <laughs> if you're if you're over fifty, you can remember teen idols and you know, and it's it's neat y'all any of y'all watch television, it's neat to see these teen idols now that in their seventies, right? It's it's cool, isn't it? <laughs> trying to dance, trying to Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, whew. Paul said, "I'm I'm going to introduce you to the Maker. I'm going to introduce you to the Giver. See those those idols they were worshiping; those were takers. Oh yeah, I, I, I hear people paying big money to to go see an idol somewhere. You know." The tickets that that you have to produce and and pay for to get to get this entertainment, and and these folks are takers. They're not going to come knock on your door and bring you a pie when you're sick. You know what I'm saying? That's right. And uh, it costs to worship idols. The 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 stuff they're all about is money, money, money. You know, these athletes get paid a lot of money, but their real wealth comes from endorsements because people think so highly of that person, they'll buy their brand name just because they got their name on it. Well, that ain't, if that ain't the silliest thing I ever heard, them folks don't even wear the, that stuff. <laughs> That's right. It's funny, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, somebody said Michael Jordan's kids wear Reebok. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But it's crazy what we'll do. But the God we serve is the giver. He's a giver. And he gives, and he gives, and he gives, and he gives. And all it costs you is your whole heart. And you can't buy one bit of time from him. You can't pay enough to get it, to sit at a table with him. You can't pay enough money to get his autograph. No, 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 no. He's not going to have a book signing. He's just going to be God. And he's going to show up in your dark room at 3 a.m. 
Put his hands on your cheek when you're, when you're worried, when you're lonely, when you're sad. He's going to put his loving arms around you and say, I got you, buddy. We got this. We're going to get through this. Anybody here been through? You've been through? You came through it. You made it. You got through it. You got through that day in court. You got through that hospital visit. You got through that emergency room. You got through that auto accident. You got through that prison sentence. You got through because he's a giver. He'll see you through. I'll tell you about the unknown God. He was raised from the dead. And he lives forevermore. Seek the Lord. Here's how you do it. Seek the Lord. The Bible says, seek and you shall find. Knock and it'll be open to you. Amen? Feel after him. I I don't hear this preached on much. But you need to know how to feel after him. Your walk, your prayer time, your worship time. Your devotion time. Feel after God. He's a God that can be felt. I looked around this room this morning and I saw grown men, strong men, weeping as they sang praises to the living God. You can feel something when you go after God. Feel after Him that He might be found. You can Seek him and you can find him. He will be found by you because he is not far from us. Because in him we live and move and have our being. He is not something you can, he's not a commodity you can package. The the commercialization of Christianity has done so much harm. I know we have to have money to publish things. I know we have to, there's certain things you, you can't just do for free. But the commercialization, the, 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 the manufacturing uh, of the Word of God and, and all that's gone into the big money system has, has not really helped You don't need to market God. You don't need to hype God up. He's God all by himself. Just be real. Brag on him. Tell it like it is. Speak the truth in love and watch God draw. The, just, just lift him up. Lift him up. He's high. He's mighty. He can do anything. That's pretty good stuff. So... Let's answer the question of where, where we know who we worship, the maker, the giver. We know how we worship. We seek him. We pray. We feel after him. We pour our devotion and life into him. Singing, praying, loving, giving. Where can we do that? So in John chapter 4 and verse 19, the question is raised about where? Jesus is at the well with a woman, and the woman says to him, Jesus, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. John 4, 19. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now, here we are, two strangers, a man and a woman, Jesus and this woman, we call her the woman at the well, and they meet up, she's a Samaritan woman, and they meet up, and she recognizes that he's somebody that ought to know things, and the biggest question on her mind is this religious argument. How many... Oh. I have precious people 
that I meet in, I met a total stranger in town the other day, and the first thing he wanted to know was a doctrinal question to me. And I'm like, man, of all the trouble that's going on in the world, and you've got this on the tip of your tongue, the first thing on your mind is my doctrinal stand on one issue. And the, the, the enemy loves that. He loves to get us wrapped up in some little sugar stick doctrine and, well, I, I, I go to that church, but they don't believe in this or that or the other. And let me tell you something. The enemy will use anything to get you distracted and try to get you bogged down. If we're going to be one church. And we, ain't none of us going to be right about everything when we get to heaven. You're going to go through the pearly gates and you're going to be wrong about something. Get ready for it. All you folks that ain't ever been wrong in your life, get ready. I believe the Apostle Paul will set you straight. Explain the way to you more perfectly. Believe it or not, there's things that I'm wrong about doctrinally. I'm a human being. I do the best I can. I know what I know, and there's stuff I don't know. I don't know it all. And if you, t if you come to me and ask me, Something I don't know, I'll just say, I don't know. Read your Bible again and keep reading it until he reveals it to you. And if he don't reveal it to you, you didn't need to know. <laughs> the Apostle Paul said, I choose to know Jesus and him crucified. I... Amen? Amen? I don't. I just don't know some stuff. I can't figure it out. I... I'm not the smartest guy. I'm not the sharpest pencil in the drawer. You know what I mean? So there's some stuff I just don't know. And these folks that act like they know it all, they're dumber than I am. <laughs> At least I admit it. So she says, you explain it to me, Jesus. Our fathers say worship over here. And you say worship in Jerusalem, but where do you say, Jesus, we ought to worship? And Jesus was so good at this stuff. She just knew she could start an argument with him. And it's hard to start an argument with truth itself. She's sitting there on the well talking to the truth, the way, and the life. And she tried to get this argument going. She tried to get this figured out. She wanted to discuss this. And he says, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither worship in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is. There's a lot of power in that little statement right there. When, I love that. True worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Here's the revelation. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Now, if he would have been the press secretary, we would accuse him of avoiding the question. Well, he didn't answer my question. But Jesus did answer the question. Where do we worship? The place is not geographical. The place is spiritual. In, worship him in, it might be your kitchen. It might be your backyard. It might be out in the garden. It might be in the river church on Sunday morning at 1025 when they're singing the best song you ever heard in your life. It might be driving down the highway. It might be at Kroger or Walmart 
or out hunting in a tree stand. It might be, where's Doug? It might be at a pig show. Doug, I'm telling you right now. It don't smell like heaven. But you can worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, I've heard that preached a lot where somebody took their pet doctrine and that bundled that up and said, this is the truth. If you don't worship him in this truth, then you're just not true worship because it's not in this truth that I like to preach. I really believe that word truth there has to do with being honest with yourself. You can't worship God with a facade. You can't fake it. You've got to worship him in sincerity in truth. You've got to be who you are. You're not fooling God. You can fool all of us. We're, we're not that hard to fool. But you're not fooling God. Worship him in spirit, life-giving, power, dunamis. Amen? Charisma. Let the spirit flow. And in truth. Just be real. Just be real. Just be honest with God. God, I don't really feel like worshiping you right now. But you're worthy. I'm going to praise you anyway. You can tell him that. Say, God, you hurt my feelings. He can take it. Feel after him. Talk to him. Be real with him. Hey, God, I didn't do that good this week. And you know it. But I'm sorry. And I still love you, and I'm going, to do, I'm going to do better next week. With your help and by grace, I'm going to worship you. Amen? Amen. I want to let the baptism candidates get ready. Um, and I want to bring the uh, praise team and singers and musicians to the front at this time. And uh, if you're involved in the... Uh, team in any way if you maybe you serve in an administrative position or uh, support of the team and just form a, a great big line across here and we're going to pray over you today so turn and face the uh, stage if you would the altar So the first revelation you have to know before you can know where to worship is to know who to worship. There are altars everywhere. Worship is everywhere because it's in spirit and it's in truth. Spirit and truth is the place of worship. Don't ever limit that. Psalm 95 says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. There's scripture for us doing what we do. We're not an entertainment group. We're not just doing this because we like to do it. And we do like to do it. It's fun. Last night was hilarious. Practice last night was so good, fun. I come to practice. They let me sing every now and then. But I come whether they let me sing or not. I just come. I like it. I mean, it's in my blood. Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come. Everybody say, come. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his 